Ruth Davidson, at the last two UK general elections, the Conservative pitch to the voters is trust us in the public finances because Labour will ruin everything. If you're so good at managing the public finances, how come you didn't eliminate the deficit by 2015? Well, we made sure that we've got the right balance between growing the economy with bringing down the deficit uh, and making sure that we're able to pub fu uh, fund public services. And I think you're beginning to see a, a difference now that you see that much of taxation and spending is devolved to Scotland. You see, Scotland is one quarter away from recession. We've got a contracting economy, but the rest of the UK is still growing at 2% per year. It's one of the highest growth rates in the G7. So we're seeing that uh, we're getting a lot of things right at Westminster. Yes, there's more work to do, but it's about striking that right balance. But why did you fail to eliminate the structural deficit by 2015? That was my question. Well, we're bringing it down. We've got new figures out today from the IFS saying it'll be down to 0 0.7, less than 1% uh, in a few Why years' time. Why didn't you eliminate it by 2015 as promised? Well, we endeavour to do that, but also to strike the right balance in terms of paying for public services. Now, we get attacked on the, the left for making cuts. We get attacked on the right for not eliminating, eliminating the deficit. But you, you can't attack us why, for both at the, the same promise, time. Why did you promise to eliminate it? Well, we endeavour to do that, to grow the economy, which we've done. We've been the fastest growing country in the G7 three of the last five years. You said you were going to eliminate it by 2015 because you were a party of responsible economic management. Now, you appear to be telling and me that, that you didn't eliminate it because you decided to increase public expenditure, if I'm picking you up right. But what I'm saying is it's about striking the right balance within public expenditure. Now, there are some areas of the public purse where, yes, we have increased spending, so things like the health service, and we would quite like to see in Scotland actually some of that money passed on through the Barnet consequentials. But we're also bringing down the deficit year on year on year, and we're continuing to be one of the fastest growing countries in the G7. So it is about striking that right balance. So this will definitely be eliminated by 2025? Absolutely. You're sure about that? I am. Well, you said it was 2015 oh. and you didn't make it. Then you changed it to 2017 and then you changed it to 2019. Mm -hmm. Now you've changed it to 2025. You have you've well, you missed it on three it. occasions. You just asked me about it. You've I missed said, it on three occasions. Why, yes, should we we, why should we believe that you'll do it a fourth time? Well, that's entirely up for people to vote at this election, but we will get it down. We're already on course for that. We've reduced it by more than half. We've kept public spending at levels which I think supports uh, the you, provision you, of services across sure the country. Are you sure about this? And we've grown, in 2015, and we've grown the, economy. the Conservatives claimed that you'd cut the deficit in half. That wasn't true, was it? Well, I'm just saying we have more than cut the deficit in half, and that I'm is true, I'm saying at the last Bernard. general election in 2015, when the Conservatives claimed they'd cut the deficit in half, that wasn't true, was it? It was pretty close to it. It was a, a it, rounding error, but it was well, absolutely it was a, no, there. It wasn't a rounding error. Come you on, cut Bernard. it by a third. Come on, Bernard. There's what? a difference between a third and a half. It, it was more than a third. And what is it now? Well, how, your, how much have we brought well, it down? Your, well, your, well, I ask the questions, that's the deal. Uh, that, my that, I'm not standing for public office. <laughs> What's your record in net public service debt, sector debt? I don't have that figure to hand at the moment. Well, again, the party of sound economic management. Since 2010, net public sector debt is up by 53%. $1.7 trillion. Pounds. Would you run your own household finances the way your party runs the country? Well, we're making sure that we're striking the right balance between growing the economy, between investing in public services. And as you well know, there are many opponents that say that we've not spent enough on those and would rather do more. You see the Corbyn manifesto that says Why that he wants to increase debt the debt. Up? Well, the reason that debt is up while the deficit is coming down, as you very well know, is you've got to eliminate a deficit before you can start paying off the debt. You know, that a deficit is a structural difference between what you bring in and what you put out. So if you're in favour of um, hard-working families, why is the tax burden in this country the highest in 30 years? We're making sure that we're spreading that evenly, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, uh, inequality is down to its lowest level my, since my, my 1986. Question, I, and I'm, ex I'm question, explaining it. Why, why is the tax burden at its highest for 30 years? And I'm trying to explain that it's moving the tax burden, so greater number of people at the top end with higher salaries paying a greater level of taxation, and we're taking people at the bottom end out of taxation altogether. Now, that does change the tax envelope, we understand that, yeah. but the top 1%, for example, are paying 27% of all income taxation. Understood, but why is the tax burden which looks at all... I mean, Conservatives are supposed to believing in low taxation, mm. an enterprise economy, to incentivise business and incentivise individuals. And so why is the state taking a bigger proportion of tax now than in any time since right. Margaret Thatcher? 
and we're incentivising uh, enterprise by bringing down corporation tax, as you know, but also as a balance with that, making sure that we crack down on those people and those companies that aren't paying their taxes. At the same time, we're shifting where the burden of taxation lies. So when we came to power, your first tax-free bit of your earnings was only £5,500. It's now growing up to £12,500. That's why inequality is down to its lowest level since 1986. Those at the top end, as you know, just before we got into power in 2010, uh, the Labour Party uh, went uh, changed the top rate of tax, sure. and we've kept it at 45%. Will the tax burden... That's why the top 1% pay more than 27% Will the tax, tax of burden all... at the end of this Parliament be higher or lower? Well, that's something that we're going to make sure we look at to and make sure that we have the right balance between what we spend sure. on our public services, what we take in, yeah. and what we incentivise for people. will the tax burden, this is not to do oh. with investment and public yeah. expenditure, this is what the government is going to take in terms of overall taxes, will it be higher or lower by the end of this parliament? The manifesto that we put out is broadly tax neutral and it's broadly neutral. So there may be so some... Be the same. So there may be some winners and losers, but one of the things that we are committed to in terms of encouraging enterprise is bringing down corporation tax and we're going to increase the levels at which people befo earn before they start paying tax, so those in the lowest incomes will definitely be better off. But given what the party has said uh, in terms of the UK manifesto, mm. in terms of income tax, and national insurance. The reason why you cannot give me a guarantee to that last question, that the tax burden will fall, is that the Conservatives have given themselves the scope to increase income tax and national insurance, haven't they? Well, what I can tell you is that in Scotland, these are decisions that we take at a Scottish level. Now, I national don't like insurance. to see... No, 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 and income tax, which you mentioned there, you're talking about Why the tax burden. Why is there not a cast-iron guarantee that there won't be an increase in national insurance? Well, people know that we're the low-tax party. We know that we've got a much better tax offer than any of our rivals that are out there. They only need to look at Scotland to see what happens uh, when you change Well, if you're a low-tax party, why can't you give people a straightforward guarantee that there will be no increases well, in national insurance in this parliament? Look, we're making sure that we strike the right balance. We know that there's going to be difficult times ahead as, as we leave Brexit. Yes, if the Chancellor wants to leave Headroom, then that's up for him Headroom, to do so. Headroom. Why, why would he want to leave Headroom? Well, just saying that the, it's, it's an issue that he has got competency over. The but reason why he wants know... to leave Headroom is that he knows, and it gets back to this whole point about deficit reduction. You've just said it's going to be dealt with by 2025. Mm. He, he, he has to leave himself the scope to be able to increase taxes if that's the only way to well, balance the books. Well, that's you editorialising now, Bernard. People know that we're the low-tax you, party. You editorialise more... here and now and say that you won't increase national insurance but, in this parliament. But look, it's not up to me because I'm not the Chancellor of the Exchequer. In terms of what we want to do in Scotland, where a lot of taxation has now been devolved, we want to make sure that we don't have higher taxation than the rest of the UK, which is what the SNP wants to bring in. They want to put, hang a sign at Gretna that says higher taxes here. We see a Labour Party that wants to put a penny on income tax rates right across the board in Scotland. We see an SNP that says that they won't use the powers they have to increase income tax to 50% at the top rate in Scotland, but they would do it okay. down south even well, though they're not standing if you can be trusted, people down south. If you can be trusted so in, in this of issue of taxation, my, can you explain no, to our let, viewers finish, why Bernard. Conservative members of Parliament said to the Chancellor of the Exchequer that he, the Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer, had betrayed the self-employed in relation to national insurance. People already know that we've helped the self-employed. Uh, we're making sure that we have funding in terms of training and skills for the people that they want to employ My question themselves. is about national insurance. Yeah. Look, the, the national insurance rate is where it is. It hasn't changed. We're making sure that we're looking after not just large businesses, but small businesses too. People know that we're bringing corporation tax down. They know we've got a really this good set... This new term for the self-employed will be seen through. There's no going back on it. Look... Bernard, people know exactly where we stand on tax. And if that's no, going they to don't. Decide With all due respect, the, the self-employed who, who were the subject of this national insurance increase, which the government then uh, kicked into the Taylor Committee in order to review this, they do not know where they stand. Can you tell them that they will well, not pay more national insurance with the election of a Conservative Bernard, as government? As you've just told the viewers at home, it's with a review committee under Lord Taylor who's looking at this, who will bring forward recommendations, who's listening to business as we speak to make sure that we get the best tax profile, not just for small businesses, but right up the business scale as well. Okay. Down south, we've increased help in terms of business rates. We're looking at ways in which we, there's, uh, in Scotland, there's a small business bonus. We're working hard in Scotland here, and the Conservatives are a lone voice here to say that we shouldn't be 
be the highest tax part of the UK. We think that that's damaging the Scottish economy. At the moment, the Scottish economy is one quarter away from recession. We're a contracting economy, while the rest of the UK's economy is growing. OK, let's move on to some of the spending commitments, because the spending commitment is for £8 billion of spending on the NHS in England over five years. That will have consequentials in Scotland. Now, I've listened very carefully to what the Prime Minister and other people have said on this. Can I ask you, is this eight billion new money? Well, that is exactly what the Prime Minister has said. Now, I remember sitting here money. in 2015. Yes, it's new money. It is new money. And I remember sitting here in 2015 when you, where there was it? a two billion pound pledge from the Conservatives and you were asking me, where's that coming from? We said it was in the envelope. You challenge and challenge and challenge and that money that, was committed. That's because that's <laughs> It's to <laughs> play devil's advocate. No, no, I absolutely the, the understand that. The eight billion that. is new money. Where is it coming from? Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's coming from within the general taxation of the country, within the pot that the government has, and Sorry, it's been allocated. If it's new money, it's in addition to what is already being spent. My mm -hmm. question is, where is it coming well, from? And, and what I'm saying is, this is exactly the same question that you asked me two years ago well, in the 2015 the general now for election. The 8 billion. Where is it coming and, from? And now I'm answering you in the same way as I answered in 2015, which was delivered. In that, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are going to allocate that new money for the NHS so that we make sure we have the health service that supports us as we ch have a changing demographic in the future are from the taxation it, reg revenue are they, are they from within the country. Are they allocating it from existing resources or are these new resources? Well, look, Bernard, you're sitting here telling me that we have a taxation burden, which you say that for Conservatives is too big. We're saying that I'm that's the right you now balance. About the money specifically and I'm explaining you. And I'm explaining is it from it to existing you. resources or is it new resources? Well, look, you have already seen the budgets that we've laid out as a party down south. You've seen the manifesto we've put The reason I'm asking you is because I don't understand this. Is it existing resources within, or new resources? Within the, within the taxation burden from the country. So it's within country, existing resources. Which is exactly where it was in 2015, right. where you, you asked me so, exactly the same questions, so, which so we delivered not, upon. We've established a, it's not new money. So if you're going to have £8 billion worth of new resources in health, what budgets are you cutting to pay for that? Well, as a growing economy, as one of the fastest growing economies in the G7, you see additional revenues coming in. Now, it is all about a balance between offsetting the So you're hoping that increased revenues revenue. generate the £8 billion. But if, it, if you don't have a growing economy and you don't but, have increased revenues, where does the £8 billion come from? Bernard, Politics is all about choices. We've made a firm sure. commitment that there will be an £8 billion pound additional spend it coming in the from? NHS That's my in exactly the same way as you asked us in 2015 and we said that we would make sure that the money was there because it was a top priority for the Conservative government. We are saying exactly the same. We delivered it in 2015. We will deliver it now. Why are you abandoning the triple lock and pensions? Because the triple lock was brought in, if, if people at home remember, uh, that there'd been a, a lot of uh, underinvestment in the pensions. There was one year where it only went up by 10 pence uh, for pensioners, and we wanted to bring it up to the level that it should have been. We will keep the triple lock until 2020 to bring it up to that level, and then we'll keep a double lock in place so it will rise either by earnings Understood. or by why inflation. Does, why is so the it never lock loses. Going? Well, because we've brought it, or by 2020, we'll have brought it back up to the level it needs to be at, and then we will make sure that it continues to grow, either with uh, with earnings uh, or inflation, whichever is the highest, so it never drops below but, that level again. But the again. financial cost of dropping the triple lock is hardly anything at all, and yet this is a policy which has the capacity to upset pensioners. Well, like I say, this is not just about making sure that you target voter groups. This is about doing the right thing for the country. We have, well, it's saving as any a money party, at all. we as I have a party, made sure that we have brought pensioners uh, up and pensions sure. uh, over the level but, of inflation. We will continue to make sure that it rises. It's hardly saving any money at all. So why drop the, the triple lock? Well, because we think that it's the right thing to do and it's sustainable for the long term. We've made a huge investment in pensions down the years. People who are in receipt of a state pension know that. Um, the Labour Party and the SNP have voted against every budget that we've had the triple lock in. Uh, we're continuing with the triple lock till 2020 and we'll keep a double lock thereafter so it never drops below that level ever again. OK, the IFS, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, mm. say the manifesto plans another five years of welfare cuts. Is that true? No, we're making sure that we're getting welfare on a sustainable footing. We've laid out a huge number of changes within the welfare system. And if you remember, the welfare system that we inherited was completely broken. So they're wrong. Oh, the IFS makes a, a lot of projections and they themselves acknowledge that projections sure. are incredibly hard to do. Are they wrong? So, well, in this instance, yes, we believe that they are. Well, can you explain to me why it is in the planned expenditure of your government, if they are wrong, there is envisaged 11 billion of cuts 
to welfare by 2021-22. Because we're trying to get more people out of welfare and, and into work. And yeah, we've had great success with that. you just told me the IFS were wrong. No, but in terms of you're talking about, I, or I assumed you were talking about releasing, reducing and cutting levels of, of welfare spending and individual budget envelopes. I said that the IFS say the manifesto plans another five years of welfare cuts. You didn't oh. agree with that, but the public expenditure projections oh. accept it. Well, sorry, I thought you were talking about the levels of payments within welfare. What we're talking about, if, as I understand it now, is you're talking about the overall welfare budget. We hope very much, and I think that every government should hope very much, to spend less on welfare as we get more people into work. Now, we've worked very hard at that. We've got more than 2 million more people in work than were when we came to power in 2010. We're also making, for the first time, making work pay. So it's not a case that you uh, re are in receipt of welfare but it would cost you money to get a job, and that's the, the system that we inherited. Okay, how are you going to get non-EU migration down to tens of thousands? Well, we're going to make sure that we work hard. We've got to set up a system. We understand that. Uh, in terms of the way in which it's worked right now, for EU migration, as you know, that was decided at a sure. Brussels level. Non-EU so, migration. Yeah, exactly, and non-EU migration was looking at that. But the Prime Minister said that she's going to look at the different ways in, in which we encourage the brightest and best to come here, but make sure but that we manage the overall You have total. responsibility over this now. I accept mm. the point that you make in sure. relation to EU migration. Mm -hmm. You've had no authority over that really at all. Non-EU mm. migration, you have responsibility over now. Mm -hmm. You're nowhere near the tens of thousands in terms of the numbers. So specific, give me a specific measure which is going to cut cut the numbers. Well, one of the things that have been laid out in the manifesto is, for example, to um, increase the amount of money that uh, companies pay to hire people who are non-UK residents uh, to come and work for them, because we don't believe that there's so many thousands of jobs well, across the country. It's up from £1,000 to £2,000, so if the companies pay the £2,000, <laughs> How are you going to well, make ask, a reduction there? You asked for a specific measure. That's one of the things that we're that there. That doesn't and, guarantee and, a cut. No, and, and in addition to that, because we don't believe that there's so many thousands of jobs across the country that only people from outside the UK can do, um, we're investing at the same time in skills back home so that we can, we can uh, I, make I, sure I that some of the uh, gaps are point, filled here. But the, you have to get this down to tens of thousands. Now, well, that means you have to crudely uh, cut the number of visas. And, and you would accept that we're actually on the way to doing that, that there has been a, a actually, very large not. reduction. There's well, been, there's been a reduction 000. in net migration figures. Mm -hmm. In terms of non-EU migration figures, they account for approximately, approximately 50% of the total. You have had complete authority over non-EU migration figures forever and a day. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not getting them down okay. to tens of thousands. They're running at about 140,000. Bernard, the idea that we haven't brought it down from the time when people like Peter Mandelson were saying they were sending out search parties to bring people to this country, uh, I think is unfair. We have brought it down. Uh, the Prime Minister wants to bring that down further. I think we've got to, again, strike the right balance between making sure we attract the brightest and best people here and we're a welcoming country and we value uh, people that come to this country, not just for their uh, for the labour market, market statistics, but also their contribution, but we also also make sure that there's public trust in the system okay. and that public trust had been eroded. On Brexit the Prime Minister mm. has said several times now that no deal is better than a bad deal. What does a bad deal look like? <laughs> well I hope very much we never have to see it because we're going to send the right team out there to negotiate a good deal. Well, wh What does a bad deal look like because she keeps using this expression. What does a bad deal look well, like? She keeps being asked would you be prepared to walk away from the table? And I think if you're going into a negotiation, and we know it's going to be a hard negotiation, that you have to absolutely be prepared to say that you will walk away. What does and no I, deal mean? Well, I, I guess that means the WTO um, you know, um, accords. OK, well, what assessment has the UK government made about the economic impact of no deal? Well, look, we're going in this to get a good deal. Now, we that want wasn't to my ensure... question, with all due respect. No, no, what assessment that. has the UK government made of no deal. Well, we've already heard what David Davis has said about that. We're making sure that we're going in with the well, right team if we're re-elected as the government. Well, remind the viewers what David Davis has said about that. Well, the work is being done on making sure that we look at the different scenarios. But so what you're we're saying, saying is... That you're saying that no deal is better than a bad deal, but the government have made no assessment of what no deal actually means. Look, Bernard, that is incredible.
competence of the first order. People absolutely understand that if you're going into a tough negotiation, you have to be prepared to say that you will walk away from the table. Otherwise, you take what you're given. But, but, the Prime but, Minister is going out no there and she's laid out... of what no deal looks like? She has laid out absolutely the way in which sure. she wants to My question go is, ahead. why is there no assessment now of what no deal there looks like? There are multiple assessments that are being done by civil servants and members of government all the time on different issues that are going to be part of the negotiation and Brexit process, which have been laid out by the Prime Minister in her 12 points in her Lancaster House speech in January of this year. OK, on Indyref 2, everybody, the world <laughs> needs dog knows where you stand on this. Uh, not until there is public consent for it to happen. Now, uh, just tell me briefly, what that's is only, public... That's only half of what's in our manifesto. <clears throat> well, how, uh, how do you measure public consent? Well, let me give you the other half as well. What we're saying is, Nicola Sturgeon came out all guns blazing after Brexit. The morning after the vote, she said she'd already instructed officials to drop the necessary legislation for a second independence referendum. Then in March, she came out and made her formal submission to the Prime Minister. And our response, Secretary of State, myself, Theresa May, absolutely united of one mind to say that the people of Scotland should not be dragged back to another referendum when they don't know the options in front of them. They don't know what Brexit looks like and they don't know what independence looks like because Nicola Sturgeon won't tell us. Nor should they be dragged back there where the people of Scotland don't want it. Sure. And I remember last year standing right next to Nicola Sturgeon while you were questioning us uh, in a debate where she said, and she looked the people of Scotland in the eye down the camera lens and said if there was no change in public support for independence, there wouldn't be another referendum. But how do you and measure... she's gone back on her words. The question is, and it's one that will be mm. put to Nicola Sturgeon as well, how do you measure public consent? Well, look, we knew what it looked like when we had it, and that was back in 2011, when they won a majority with a clear commitment in their manifesto, when there was public support that said we should ask the question, running at 92%. Every single member of the Scottish Parliament recognised that that mandate existed. And Civic Scotland, the business organisations, the umbrella organisations said, yes, let's have this debate now. But we were promised that if we had that debate in good faith, the result would be respected. And Nicola Sturgeon's gone back on her word. If, and we can send her a message at this election if, to tell her to take it off the, the table. SNP and that's exactly what I intend to do. this election do as they did in 2015 and won a half of the popular vote, would that be a mandate for another referendum? Well, I'm not going to call this election ahead of time, but I will be would tremendously it, it, surprised yeah, but if they would it be a mandate? Win. Well, Nicola Sturgeon said in 2015 that it wasn't. She said after she got 56 members of the Scottish Parliament, sorry, members of the Parliament out of 59, she said that it wasn't. But would you regard it as a mandate? Absolutely not. No, not no. even if not even if more than half of the Scottish people vote for the SNP at this election, that wouldn't well, constitute in your view. A have mandate. you seen what's in? Have you seen the step back she's taken in her manifesto that she published just today, just nine days I'm before the poll? I'm asking you about your views. And I'll, I'll get <laughs> well, to Nicola well, Sturgeon. A mandate so, also includes what you put in your manifesto, and it was very different between 2011 uh, and 2016, and it's different again today. Okay, and well, I will fight it every step of the way. <laughs> indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Ruth Davidson. No doubt we'll get to all of these uh, questions okay. uh, to the First Minister as well.